Jay Flash here on Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The Obama administration's budget proposal for the Office of National Drug Control Policy sets aside nearly twice the amount of funding for law enforcement and criminalization than for treatment and prevention of drug addiction. Out of a total of $15.5 billion, some $10 billion are used for enforcement. National Drug Control Policy Gil Kurlkowski praised the numbers as reflecting a balanced and comprehensive drug strategy. Well, just last year, the newly appointed drug czar and former Seattle police chief had called for an end to the so-called war on drugs, raising hopes among advocates of harm reduction approaches to curbing drug use. In an interview with The Wall Street Journal last May, Kurlikowski said people see a war as a war on them. We're not at war with people in this country. Well, I'm joined right now here in the Democracy Now! studio by a doctor who spent the last 12 years working with one of the densest populations of drug addicts in the world. Dr. Gabor Mate is the staff physician at the Portland Hotel, a residence and harm reduction facility in Vancouver, Canada's downtown east side. Dr. Mate also treats addicts at the only safe injection site in North America, a center that's come under fire from Canada's conservative government, led by Stephen Harper. Dr. Gabor Mate is the best-selling author of four books. His latest, just out in the United States, is called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction. Welcome to Democracy Now! Pleasure Dr. to be Mate. here. Now, <clears throat> what do you mean the only safe injection site, the only legal injection site in North America? People inject heroin there? People are allowed to bring their drugs there. We don't provide them with their drugs. I think we should, but we don't. But they bring it in, and without fear of being arrested, they're allowed to inject under supervision, and the staff, without being fear arrested, are allowed to help them inject in a safe way, give them clean needles, sterile swabs, and resuscitate them if they overdose. So everywhere else in Canada or in the States, of course, these activities would all be illegal. Why are they allowed to do this? Well, it was conceived at a moment of political openness, uh, because um, so many people pass on infections, uh, like HIV and hepatitis C, to one another through injection use, sharing needles. They, inject, they infect themselves with bacteria from their skin by using uh, dirty water. So it's a harm reduction measure that, in many studies, have been shown to re reduce the burden of disease and also the economic costs attendant to addiction to society. And do you find that um, addicts can actually uh, heal themselves or perhaps uh, be able to get off heroin more easily by injecting there? Well, the, the facility is not designed to treat addiction per se. It's designed to reduce the harm from it. It's a harm reduction measure. What we do find, though, is that we have a detox facility on the second floor, which is where I've been working, and people come from the injection facility to detox, because they've been into, brought into contact with compassionate caregivers, perhaps for the first time in their lives. These people all had very tough lives, and so for them to even contemplate receiving help uh, takes a lot of trust. Talk about the people you treat. Well, the uh, hardcore drug addicts that I treat, but according to all studies in the States as well, are without exception people who've had extraordinarily difficult lives. and the commonality is uh, childhood abuse. In other words, uh, these people all entered life under extremely adverse circumstances. Um, not only did they not, not get what they need for healthy development, they actually got negative circumstances of neglect. I don't have a single female patient in the downtown east side who wasn't sexually abused, for example, as were many of the men, or abused, neglected, and abandoned serially over and over and again. And that's what sets up the brain biology of addiction. In other words, the addiction is related both psychologically in terms of emotional pain relief and neurobiological development to early adversity. What does the title of your book mean, In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts? Well, it, it's a Buddhist phrase. In the Buddhist psychology, there are a number of realms that human beings cycle through, all of us. One is the human realm, which is ordinary cells. The hell realm is that of unbearable rage, uh, fear, pair, you know, these emotions that are difficult to handle. The animal realm is our instincts and our id and our passions. Now, the hungry ghost realm the creatures in it are depicted as people with large empty bellies, small mouths, and scrawny thin necks. They can never get enough satisfaction. They can never fill their bellies. They're always hungry, always empty, always seeking it from the outside. That speaks to a part of us that I have, 
and everybody in our society has, where we want satisfaction from the outside, where we're empty, where we want to be soothed by something in the short term, but we can never feel that or fulfill that uh, insatiety from the outside. But the addicts are in that realm all the time. Most of us are in that realm some of the time. And my point really is, is that there's no clear distinction between the identified addict and the rest of us. There's just a continuum on which we're all maybe found. They're on it because they've suffered a lot more than most of us. Can you talk about the biology of addiction? For sure. Uh, you see, the, if you look at the brain circuits involved in addiction, and, whether, and that's true whether it's a shopping addiction like mine or uh, an addiction to opiates like the heroin addict, we're looking for endorphins in our brains. Endorphins are the brain's feel-good, reward, pleasure, and pain relief chemicals. They also happen to be the love chemicals. They connect us to the universe and to one another. Now, that circuitry in addicts doesn't function very well. As the circuitry of incentive and motivation, which involves the chemical dopamine, also doesn't function very well. Stimulant drugs like cocaine and crystal meth, nicotine and caffeine, all elevate dopamine levels in the brain, as does sexual acting out, as does extreme sports, as does workaholism and so on. Now the issue is, why do these circuits not work so well in some people? Because the drugs in themselves are not surprisingly addictive. And, that, and what I mean by that is, is that most people who try most drugs never become addicted to them. And so there has to be susceptibility there. And the susceptible people are the ones with these impaired brain circuits, and the impairment is caused by early adversity rather than by genetics. What do you mean early adversity? Well, uh, the human brain, unlike any other mammal, for the most part develops under the influence of the environment. So, um, and that's because from the evolutionary point of view, we develop these large heads, large forebrains, and to walk on two legs, we have a narrow pelvis. That means large head, narrow pelvis, we have to be born prematurely. Otherwise, we'd never get born. The head already is the biggest part of the body. Now, the horse can run on the first day of life. Human beings aren't that developed for two years. That means much of our brain development that in other animals occurs safely in the uterus, for us, has to occur out there in the environment. And which circuits develop and which don't depend very much on our environmental input. When people are mistreated, stressed, or abused, their brains don't develop the way they ought to. It's that simple. And unfortunately, my profession, the medical profession, puts all the emphasis on genetics rather than on the environment, which, of course, is a simple explanation. It also takes everybody off the hook. What do you mean it takes people off the hook? Well, if people's behaviors and dysfunctions are regulated, controlled, and determined by genes, we don't have to look at child welfare policies. We don't have to look at the kind of support that we give to pregnant women. We don't have to look at the kind of non-support that we give to families, so that, you know, most children in, in North America now are, have to be away from their parents from an early age on because of economic considerations, and especially in the States, because of the welfare laws. Uh, women are uh, forced to go find low-paying jobs far away from home, often single women, and not see their kids for most of the day. Under those conditions, kids' brains don't, doesn't develop, uh, doesn't, don't develop the way they need to. And so, if it's all caused by genetics, we don't have to look at those social policies. We don't have to look at our politics that disadvantage certain minority groups, so cause them more stress, cause them more pain. In other words, more predisposition for addictions. Uh, we don't look, have to look at economic inequalities. If it's all genes, it's all, we're all innocent, and society doesn't have to take a hard look at its own attitudes and policies. Um, can you talk about this whole approach of criminalization versus harm reduction? Mm -hmm. 